Hello, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here having you to talk about a bit about Red Hat and how Spring Boot and Spring Cloud fits on the Red Hat ecosystem. My name is Edson Yanaga. I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Yanaga. I'm from the Red Hat Developer Program, which is the Red Hat business unit focused on uh, improving the developer experience of Red Hat products. So we're all about empowering developers to produce and craft better software and to deliver that into production. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP and a Red Hat employee, which means that we live in a very cool world these days. I like to say that, at least I like to think that, in the end, it all means that open source won. Okay? So that's why we're all here discussing about Red Hat's products and technologies, everything open source. In particular, we from the Java world, we, we are benefiting from open source uh, software for a long time, right? And I'd like to give you a tip. I don't know how many of you attended my session uh, on this morning, but I've just launched a book from O'Reilly, which is Migrating to Microservices Databases. I've been discussing DevOps for the past like five, six years, and microservices in particular for the past three years. And the number one question that always arises um, in every microservice discussion is if the best practice is to just split my monolith into microservices and I need um, uh, one database by microservice, how do I deal with my old legacy monolithic relational database? I didn't have an answer for that, but I decided in the past like uh, one year and a half, I decided to do a research and I talked to many people worldwide how they solved this problem and I collected all of these experiences in this book which is the ebook is available uh, for free for you to download at this URL or if you visit the DevZone yeah, uh, booth at the Expo Hall, you might get a printed copy. I was signing some copies before, before the session. If you didn't get a chance to pick one, uh, maybe we have some available left on the booth, right? And uh, I always like to start my sessions with, uh, with this quote from Forbes, which is, now every company is a software company. I think that we live, uh, I also like to introduce myself as a software craftsman. And the best definition of a software craftsman that I have is that somebody who cares about his job. I truly believe that we're responsible for everything, every single innovation that is going to happen in the next thousand years. So I think it's not a, a, a lie or a mistake to say that we developers, we are the most important people on the planet from now on because everything that is going to happen, everything that is going to change this world for the better or for the worse uh, is because a software developer is behind it. And we call this uh, digital economy. And I thought uh, that economy had to do everything to about, about money. But then after studying a bit of economy, I realized the economy is the science that studies uh, relationship between people. So economy has everything to do about people. So how are we using our software to benefit the people's lives? Because, uh, uh, because we know that we can screw people's lives too. Uh, we, we know the experience of being miserable using software that doesn't uh, attend our expectations. So some years ago, I decided to make a choice to make, uh, to improve people's lives with the software that I do. And I know that if you're all here today, that's because you also care and you want to improve people's lives too. So congratulations to all of you, okay? And just to say some uh, interesting companies from this new digital economy. Uh, the largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars, which is Uber. The largest lodging company in the world owns no real estate, which, which is Airbnb. The largest online retailer in the world owns no stock, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. All of these companies, they have something in common, that they only exist and they're only enabled through software. So software changes people's lives for the better and for the worse, and we can consciously, consciously make a choice, right? I forgot to say, I'm a Brazilian and Japanese, and I'm very proud to be here at Boston for the first time to present to you. And I have to, uh, I have to tell you something, uh, it's, uh, which might sound weird in a Red Hat conference, but I've been a Spring user my entire life. Before joining Red Hat, I was an independent consultant, and of course, I was a software developer. I still am a software developer, and I've been using Spring since version 1.0 beta 2, 
So I have some experience on how Spring evolved in the past, uh, uh, not just in the past few years, but the whole time uh, of uh, existing uh, Spring. So I might be able to give you some feedback, but now that I'm working for Red Hat, there's this question. Uh, I want to use Spring Boot or Spring Cloud, but I like to be supported by Red Hat. I want to run these uh, cool technologies on top of the Red Hat stack. How do I do that? Is that a sin to be doing that? And I want to answer you that, that no, we can do both. Okay. There are some other sessions discussing this topic too, but I think I'm the only one that has a Spring Boot and Spring Cloud in the title, okay? So some questions about, uh, I'd like to clarify some misconceptions about Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and how they, uh, they fit into the entire ecosystem. First, many people that think that uh, to be creating a microservice, I need to create a fat jar because, you know, that's a single deployment unit, that's a single artifact. No, it's not. Microservices are all about architecture, about the fact that you're having a, a multiple moving parts in a distributed system. So if you're creating a, a distributed system with different artifacts, and doesn't matter which artifact you choose, then probably you have a microservices architecture. So there's no clear definition also of size. So you can have like two big monoliths and some people might still call that a microservice architecture. So it's a bit cloudy definition in this cloudy world. Uh, so FatJar doesn't mean microservice. You can be uh, uh, creating your different applications. In fact, it's not the scope of this talk, but I'm writing an article about that. Different deployment options because with containers, it changes everything. Uh, FatJar uh, applications used to be uh, much uh, better for deployment options before the world of containers. I use that a lot in production environments too. That's why I was a fat jar of, uh, I was a huge fan of fat jars even before we had Spring Boot because we had things like Maven Shade plugin that helped a lot to deploy application, especially if you had like multiple different customers with different deployment sites. The fact that you had a single jar, a single artifact to copy to your customers helped a lot. But the world changed now that we have containers, right? And the second, point that I would like to address is what I call cargo code, which is the practice of believing that just because other people are doing this and it's good for them, it's good for me too. And sometimes it's not, I always, uh, maybe it's good for you, but I always like to say if you know why people are using a certain stack or certain technology, if you know why they chose to do that, and if you have the same reasons that they had in the past, maybe it's a fit for your environment. So instead of just adopting just new technology or just know the new framework that has just happened on the market. Maybe if you know the reasons why you should be choosing one instead of the other, then you'll be able to do much better architecture decisions. And of course, then maybe you'll be able to regret less later when your architecture has evolved. So if it's good for Netflix, it's good for me, right? Well, 90% or maybe more of the developers worldwide, uh, we develop enterprise software. And we have completely different requirements from these companies like Amazon, Netflix, or Google, or eBay, which uh, created most of the technology that we're used today, which is a good thing because they have tons of cash and developers to be developing this kind of stuff instead of getting uh, um, a proven and trusted technology which is already in production in many different sites. So if you think about when Netflix decides to change his stack, to change his business to an online delivery uh, platform, uh, they had nothing to start with. They had Amazon, they decided to, to do that on Amazon, on the cloud environment. Then they, just, they had some challenges, they had some problems. There was nothing ready for them. Then they started solving some of these problems. Since their system, they, their teams were split uh, between many different uh, smaller teams, each one of them started to create its own solutions. Then they realized, that, uh, wait, each one of these teams, because you have highly skilled uh, engineers, and each one of them is started to solve the same problems. So, in so instead of letting them waste their time solving the same problems over and over again, they decided to consolidate that on some libraries. That's why, for example, Netflix decided to 
to standardize its 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 platform on the JVM, so the, so that uh, all of their teams could reuse the same set of libraries to solve the same set of problems. Okay, so they didn't have anything, but they had talent engineers. They have many people working on the same problems, so they created a common solution, and they they then they started reusing that. That was like many years ago. It's 2017 and we don't have to create this architecture from scratch. And I'm not saying that the Netflix staff is bad, I'm saying that it's just simply awesome because the way that they solve their problems uh, changes the way that most of us think about how we should program distributed systems today. So if you're talking about Netflix, how many of you are aware of Hystrix, Ribbon, Eureka, uh, Arcos, okay, uh, most of you? So these technologies are just awesome and they were like, they, uh, again, when they were released at, as an open source project, it changed everything. Uh, the Spring guys, they didn't took so long for them to realize that, oh, this is a cool thing. So they integrated that into the Spring uh, ecosystem. So just for us to, to um, be aware of the difference between Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, because many people think it's the same thing, the great asset of Spring Boot is the auto configuration uh, of the dependencies uh, for reasonable defaults and reasonable overriding too. So if you have a, if you create a Spring Boot application, you have the FET jar plugin, which will create a single deployment artifact for you. But the very cool thing about Spring Boot is that you can add just a single artifact into your class path. If it already has a starter, it will auto detect the dependencies and auto configure for you. Or else if you have the option, you can enable this dependency just using a sensible annotation, like at enable something, you have the dependency running, which was the biggest like um, problem with the Spring framework in the past. You had to configure a lot of things. With Spring Boot, they simply solved this problem. And uh, before that, I don't know how many of you remember Spring.io, which meant a different thing because one of the problems of the Spring framework was that you had different versions of Spring with different versions of compatible dependencies. It was a problem for you to handle which version is compatible with which, which one. So they created something called Spring.io, which is like a, was a, a bill of materials that solved this problem, and later they integrated this build of materials into Spring Boot. So Spring IO doesn't exist, exist anymore because now it's integrated into the dependency ecosystem of Spring Boot. That's Spring Boot. Spring Cloud is the very nice initiative of the Spring guys to integrate a lot of different technologies that make sense on this new cloud, cloud native world. And a great part of this stack is provided by Netflix, okay? If you, so they have an opinionated approach, but if you want to use, if you already use Spring and you want to reuse the things that Netflix did, which has a different uh, programming model from the traditional Spring and the traditional Java E world, you can, with Spring Cloud, you can reuse these technologies easily with the same programming model that you're used to. So we have other initiatives like Wildflux Forum, for example, is trying to do with the, Spring, the, with the Netflix stack uh, the same thing. Uh, as Spring Cloud did. We're trying to get the same programming model from Java E uh, integrated to with the Netflix OSS stack. So you see, there are some uh, uh, good things working on. And again, context is king because if we're talking about microservices and architectures, it's very important for you to know uh, how the things happened in the past, why they, these teams took the, these decisions, and how can we do different these days, okay? So, when we're talking about distributed systems, there are a lot of requirements that you have to fulfill to have a successful distributed architecture or microservice architecture. I chose just five to make it shorter for us. So, we have like five challenges, which is the challenge that we face uh, uh, at the early beginning when we're starting to create our microservice architecture, which are centralized configuration. If I have multiple moving parts, I don't want to have like 10 different ways or 10 different uh, points of, conf of configuring my system because then my state is dis distributed and it's hard to manage. Then maybe I need to centralize the configuration somewhere. 
Yeah. Also distributed tracing, because in the past I had the stack trace to help me when things went wrong. But now when um, one single request can span through multiple different artifacts in the distributed system, and when I have multiple copies of the same artifacts running, it's important for me to know into which of these artifacts the request came from. And if it is low, because the problem is not a failure. When uh, something fails, uh, you know, uh, it's easy to spot on. But the worst possible scenario in a distributed system is when things start to get slow. Uh, to realize which is, the, which is the artifact that is causing this sluggishness into your system, it is very hard. That's why you need distributed tracing. Then we can integrate with other technologies. For example, Spring, uh, Netflix OS, uh, Spring Cloud integrates with Zipkin, which is an implementation uh, provided by Twitter as an open source project. You also need service discovery. You only had one single monolith. Now you have multiple moving parts. These artifacts, uh, you, they need to communicate with each other, and they have to locate each other by some way. So think about that that's the microservice version of the old service broker. You need some, some way to locate those, those services. You also need load balancing. And when I say load balancing, you can have two different kinds of load balancing. You can have server-side load balancing. Server-side load balancing is um, a feasible solution when you have um, all of your uh, server-side artifacts are exposed through a, through a router. And all of your artifacts are inside the same network. They have. Um, uh, the same configuration, so the same version of your artifacts and everything else. So you can, you can expect all of your end, uh, back-end endpoints to have the same performance. Okay? So server-side you know, load balance is the simplest possible solution for your problem. But again, Netflix had this problem, so we're trying to solve the, the way Netflix did. We also have client-side load balancing, which means that I, uh, we, we, if I have a very large distributed system, Imagine that here I am at Boston, but uh, I can issue connections to, my, uh, connections to my data center at Florida or California. Then one of them maybe is faster than the other. So client side load both uh, provide the same service for me. Client side load balances is interesting because the latency or the performance of the data centers might uh, vary depending on the client and not on the server load. So we have this to deal with too. And circuit breaker. Uh, if, uh, if you're aware of Hystrix too, Circuit Breaker, which Hystrix is the most popular Circuit Breaker implementation on the Java world, is the ability to you to handle faults on your system. Because if you had a monolith, uh, a fault usually meant a failure because you only had one moving part. But if you have multiple moving parts, you can't allow your uh, your your faults to be multiplied by the number of artifacts that you have to have a failure. Okay. You're, you need to improve your availability uh, with circuit breaking. But then Netflix had to deal with all of this, all of these complexities, because they didn't have anything to start uh, uh, with. So they coded all of these things by themselves, plus the business logic of their systems, right? That's the, the context that. Uh, motivated the implementations from the Netflix OSS library. They didn't have anything. They, did, they had to solve these problems in blue first to then address the problems in green, which is their business use case. But again, we're in 2017. Maybe we can address these issues in a different way. If I had to, to show you that, uh, uh, Netflix chose this approach. All of these problems for them were uh, addressed on the application level. So coders were mixing their infrastructure, uh, or, well, this distributed system problems and the business logic on the same level. They were responsible for dealing with all of that. But now that we, uh, more than eight years or nine, yeah, the Netflix solved these problems, maybe we have uh, other solutions for doing the same thing. So the thing that I wanted to tell you today, that in 2017, we as software developers, we don't have to care about the problems that Netflix solved in the past if we're doing microservices. All of these problems that I'm showing you today and many other, but just chose five to discuss today, 
Centralized configuration, service discovery, secret breaking, distributed tracing, and load balancing, they don't need to be handled by developers. You don't need to create another artifact in your system to be handled these services. You can rely or on infrastructure or on middleware provided by third parties to solve this problem for you, okay? And many, if not most of these services, are provided by platforms like Kubernetes and OpenShift. And for the problems that just plain infrastructure can't solve, we are in the, we are in the exact moment in the IT field where we are developing the new solutions that will handle problems like distributed tracing. Yeah, you see, tracing, you need to instrument your application code so you, can, you, you are able to trace your request between multiple artifacts. You need some kind of thing inside your application code to be able to trace that. But you don't want to be intrusive. So maybe one part of that can be handled by infrastructure so that I don't, I, me, as a software developer, don't have to deal with that. So we're developing some solutions. Today I'll show you one of these possible solutions and I hope to be able to, to show that how cool, how cool is that, right? So we have this, but I discussed it a lot. I wanted to show you some code of everything I will, I'm telling you, how it can be simple. So I'll do the basic, if you're used to Spring and you're using already, oops. And you're already in use, using and creating your Spring. Your Spring Boot application. This is a Spring Initializer which is another cool thing for me to start my Spring project because in the past it used to be very hard to create my bone.xml. And suppose I want to create a very simple artifact. If I wanted to start a Spring ecosystem, I would have to create like, oh, I need a config server, yeah, which I will not create, create today, which is the centralized configuration. Maybe there's another way to provide that. And if I wanted to create a REST endpoint for my application, maybe I needed a web endpoint. I could create a REST repository. I could be using JPA. I could be using A2. Uh, if I want to gather my configuration from a centralized endpoint, then I need a config client. If I want to enable um, circuit breaking, then maybe I need a Hystrix 2 to enable my, my circuit breaking capabilities. Uh, what else? Uh, REST repositories. I also like the whole browser. Yeah, and this is the basic stuff for me to develop just a single endpoint on the ecosystem. So let's generate this project. Zip it. Okay, now my ID is importing that. And I'll just show you presentation mode. Okay, demo application. If I have here my Spring Boot application, uh, my bootstrap class with the main method, if I wanted to enable Hystrix, I just had to en enable Hystrix. Uh, the config client is already built in. What else? Then I want to create a REST endpoint. So I'm gonna create here a new Java class, hello controller. Then REST controller. Is it big enough? Reasonable? Okay. Method get path hello. Right? Return hello. That's the simple simplest possible endpoint that you that you're doing. But if you want to enable, I want to enable Hystrix because maybe this endpoint is doing a remote invocation or maybe it's uh, accessing a, another endpoint and it might fail. So I want to add some Hystrix commands for that. If you ever try to use that, uh, why did I say that Spring Cloud did a very nice integration? If you ever try to use Hystrix by hand, you know it's, the, it's a bulky API. I had to create like something like this, abstract hystrix command. Then I want to return a string. Then I had to hystrix, oops. Oh, sorry. Hystrix command builder. Uh, just to compile, okay? And dot is key. Then I had to implement these methods. Run, 
which was supposed to return my implementation. And if it failed, I would provide a fallback. Get fallback, uh, which is like buy. So I could return hello. Right here. All right. This is one of the possible implementations. This code won't work, but ju just wanted to show you uh, how, how the basic history programming was. We have like, I have to extend the class and everything else. It's bulky. Maybe we can do better. And the Spring Cloud solution was to, instead of doing all of these things, I could just say, return hello. And I has, could have a method private string fallback. And say that return by. Uh, and say that this method, I want to wrap around that, saying that I have a history command, and the fallback method, it means fallback. So if you have the same signature here, if it's compatible, it will just invoke this method if anything fails here. But then I'm thinking, me as a software developer, am I responsible for dealing with this fallback? Uh, uh, this dependency is just a string. Uh, it's easy for you to miss the fallback configuration, right? It is easy for you to miss time. Then the first time I implemented something using this history command, I started, uh, I became amazed about, oh, now I'm capable of dealing with the fallback without that horrible try catches or history command or everything else. So I, at first, I thought it was a very nice approach. Then I started thinking, maybe there is not a better way for me to handle be handling these failures in my system instead of uh, uh, requiring me to be coding. And you realize that uh, the, co the code starts to become bulky, right? You have a lot of business code, then you have to deal with the distributed system failures and you have to provide them uh, in your code. So I started uh, researching a bit about this topic and then we have companies that are already solving this problem without having, uh, requiring you to code. Instead you can rely on infrastructure or middleware to solve all of these problems. And how uh, are they solving this problem? They're solving this problem because now uh, Kubernetes has become like the de facto standards for running containerized applications in production. It's the most widespread uh, container orchestration implementation. So many of the solutions are uh, building on top of the Kubernetes capabilities to handle this kind of problems. And I'm just showing you the, the, the circuit breaker behavior, but all of the other things like Client side load balancing, uh, server side load balancing, uh, what else? Distributed tracing can be handled by this uh, cool new project that people are using. But I want you to show how to handle that. And first, let me uh, show you the big picture of uh, why are we choosing this way of solving problems instead of relying just on code, because I believe that um, uh, our time as software developers is very valuable. So instead of everything, I think that everything that can be handled by a ready-to-go solution like infrastructure or middle, we're not developing our relational database systems by the, ourselves. We're not developing message queues by ourselves. We're not developing transactional systems by ourselves. We just reuse the things that we believe from middleware and infrastructure for us to leverage our business use case. That's how I think that development should be done because it's the most productive way to be done. So yeah, thinking about the big picture, what, how the Kubernetes platform enabled all of these problems to be solved in an easier way. And first I would like to, to change the discussion. It's not just the platform. It's not just Kubernetes, it's not just code. You have to, to see the whole picture. You also have to deal with how you deal with your deployments. If you're thinking about doing microservice architecture, you need to think about how you deploy your code. So you need to be advanced enough, and I'm pretty sure that if you're thinking about microservices, you're already creating canary deployments. So you don't have just a single instance of an artifact to run into production. You have canary deployments, which means that uh, you not just release a version into production, you will first test uh, in a canary, I'll just create one instance of my service and I'll be loading traffic to smaller amounts into production so that if anything goes wrong, I can just switch the load to the other service with the previous versions and everything will be, will be, will 
stay okay, right? So one of the premises of the solutions that I'm going to show you now depends on, I have advanced deployment scenarios and I'm doing at least canary deployments. I'm able to have multiple versions of my artifacts into production at a given moment, right? So I have canaries, so I have different versions, so I can deploy a new version and test it before I, I just roll the upgrade to the, all of the, the, of the instances. And how Kubernetes and OpenShift can help me on this? Uh, and the basic solution is that traditionally, if you have a container orchestration platform, you have the instance of a container. And usually when you say your artifact, it used to mean just your container running into a given host. But with Kubernetes, uh, now you have the concept of a pod. With Kubernetes, it doesn't schedule containers, it schedules pods. I don't know how many of you had this issue, but I'm a, uh, as a Brazilian, I'm a non-native English speaker. So I speak Portuguese, not Spanish. And uh, the problem for me, uh, the idea, for me, pod, it meant something like a capsule. Yeah, that's what I uh, th uh, thought it was meant a pod. But then I realized that talking with uh, Americans that pod is the collective of uh, whales or dolphins or something. Then it all makes sense. Oh my God, what is a pod? It's a collection of containers. Which kind of containers? Containers that have the same life cycle. Containers that should be always scaled up, stop it and start it together. Containers that share the same life cycle. Then. We came with the concept of sidecar containers. What, we, uh, what is a sidecar container? Sidecar container is a container that only exists to serve the main container. So imagine your container, your application container is the main container of the pods, but you can create another container, a sidecar container, that will help you with middleware capabilities, that will help you to instrument and empower your application. What this sidecar container can do for you, it can handle you this kind of things like circuit breaking, load balancing, tracing, so that you don't have to put the, all of these things inside your application. You can just use a sidecar container for that, right? So that's what I want to show you today. Uh, we have some interesting projects uh, with sidecar containers, we're evaluating which one of these options are gonna be built in on the OpenShift platform, for instance. The most promising sidecar containers technologies uh, as of today are particularly Linkerd, which already is a cloud native computing foundation project, and Envoy, which was open sourced by Lyft, right? We, I'm showing you, uh, this is a Grafana dashboard showing the statistics for a Linkerd installation. But uh, uh, Linkerd is written in Scala, and Envoy is written in C++. So um, it's just my particular opinion, not Red Hat's opinion. Maybe uh, Envoy might be a better solution because C++ is faster and also has lower memory requirements for you to run as a sidecar container because a sidecar container is supposed to be small right, not bigger than your application. That's why many people are considering Envoy. And not just Red Hat is taking a look at Lyft and Red Hat is taking a look at Envoy. We have other players on the industry like IBM, IBM which are contributing to Envoy too. So that's one of the things that you should be, be taking a look. So imagine if you want to do this kind of circuit breaker that I show you here today, then you need code because this code uh, assumes that you will only have a single instance of your artifact run into production and if that instance fails, then I'm supposed to give you a fallback to be delivered to the endpoint, right? That's the way you solve by codes. But then when we realize that you can have multiple different instances run into production, you can use something like I said, uh, Linkerd, which allows you to uh, Linkerd acts like a proxy. You have your application. Your application, it doesn't communicate anymore with the, the endpoint. The application connects to Linkerd. Linkerd acts as a proxy, and the Linkerd container connects to your remote endpoints. So if you have your request in service A, and the service A has a canary deployment, oh, it's buggy. Uh, Linkerd realizes that and takes the, the buggy deployment out of the um, 
out of the load balancing pool. So we will be only issuing requests to the safe ones, right? It's all handled by the sidecar container. You don't have to type a single line of code in your application. You just have, to, in Kubernetes OpenShift, you just have to type um, a few lines of YAML inside your, your Kubernetes or OpenShift uh, deployment configuration, which will be created by, with the aid of your ops guys for you to create this deployment scenario. And it will be automatically given to you these kind of things. And I'll show you that this kind of scenario improves your availability even more than just pro programming your circuit breaker uh, in your application. Here, I have three different scenarios of um, circuit breaking functionality. Okay, which is much more uh, sophisticated than the one provided by Hystrix, for example. Linkerd and Envoy2, they both provide the same set of, of capabilities. You see here, I had uh, three different instances, and this first graph, the first row here of the graph, provides me the overall availability of my uh, responses to my clients. If you see, the first row provides me the standard Hystrix capabilities of I try, if it failed, I take it, um, I, I give you the fallback, I, I take it off from the load balancing, and then I wait for uh, uh, some period to try again, then I keep doing that, but if I do that, you see, I have 100%, the best I can achieve with this kind of circuit breaking functionality on this history particularly is 96%. So I have an availability of 96% of my services if I'm using a traditional uh, circuit breaking approach, right? If I try to create a more sophisticated circuit breaking approach, you see that my uh, success rate improves a lot and it's even closer to the like, it's like 99% uh, at this moment. Uh, uh, what is that? This is the consecutive failures. Um, approach, it means that Linkerd keeps hitting. Uh, it, it, um, instead of using the, just the traditional way of uh, getting the, the endpoint out of the system, it tries five consecutive times. And if you you've get a threshold, uh, I say, well, I need at least 80% on the last five consecutive requests. If it doesn't get like 80%, at least I remove that from, the, from my request pool. Then you can get like uh, 90, uh, at this point, 98. And it even uh, work because uh, this graph was supposed to be higher, much closer to 99.5%. But now the success rate is just 99%, but it's pretty high, which is the success rate. Linkerd now, it, it creates a statistics from the requests. So each one of your endpoints has to, be, uh, has to have at least 90% of success in the past 20 requests for it to be considered live. Anything less than that is automatically removed from Linkerd, right? And if you see, if Linkerd is proxying all of the connections, Linkerd can do the circuit breaking, Linkerd can do the load balancing, can choose the fastest endpoint to connect to, and Linkerd can also do the tracing because Linkerd knows the connection is starting here, is going, is coming back. Uh, Linkerd can instrument your requests so the information can be passed on all of the, the other endpoints. I'm going to say Linkerd, but then when I say Linkerd, I mean sidecar containers because Envoy can do the same for you. Another, uh, and we have other instances. I'm saying that we don't have a clear choice yet because we have a lot of different teams solving the exactly same problems. And we have even a discussion in the Kubernetes community once we realize which are the best solutions for these kind of problems, this kind of functionality will not be even provided by third parties, but will be built in inside Kubernetes. Okay? So, uh, uh, that's some of the concepts that I, I'd like to show you today. I wanted to say that uh, it's great for you to code all of, in, all of the solutions, but it's even better if you can rely on infrastructure or middleware for you to provide these services, right? And you can see that uh, many different um, kind of problems are being solved every day and more through side con sidecar containers. If you think in the past that uh, middleware used to reside on one specific server, this is the message broker server, this is the relational database service because it solved very specific problems. 
The future of meter solutions uh, is to reside on sidecar containers because many of the capabilities that we require today are not being provided by remote endpoints, but we're adding new capabilities to our application just by adding sidecar containers to our deployments. Okay? This is clearly the trend of uh, future clouds and container application developments. Okay? And that's the demo that I wanted to show you today. I still have five minutes for some discussions. I was discussing with some people outside. I know that many of you have some uh, questions and doubts about how Red Hat will continue to support this uh, uh, environment. If you uh, to, uh, uh, at Summit, we're talking about new thing called uh, OpenShift application environments. So if you were wondering, I want to keep using the Red Hat stack, but I want to use Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Uh, we're offering different levels of support for different stacks that you'll be able to use. So uh, the cool thing, I want to use Artemis or I want to use uh, InfiniSpan, uh, JBoss Data Grid on my Spring Boot application, but it used to be so hard to configure. That's why Red Hat is providing all of the Spring Boot starter, Artemis, Spring Boot, InfiniSpan uh, starters for Spring Boot. So you will be able to just add a dependency on your class path and to have it automatically configured on your Spring Boot application, right? So uh, you can check, uh, there are other sessions talking about OpenShift application environments. So you can check which, uh, um, which of the starters are being provided and which is the level of support into each one of these um, starters, right? So what else would I have to say? Uh, developments, you might think that uh, is it hard to be creating these sidecar containers or using these capabilities or you deploying these applications in the Kubernetes environment. In the previous session, I believe they, show you, they showed uh, a solution from Red Hat which is the Container Development Kit, which is a virtual machine. You just type one, one type, uh, it's a Vagrant app or a mini shift start, which is a complete OpenShift and Kubernetes cluster that you can spin off on your, in, a, in a small VM on your machine. Okay. And you also have, if you're having trouble deploying your application to the Kubernetes platform for packaging or everything else, how many of you have heard about Fabricate? Okay. Fabricate, uh, it's a problem when I ask that because Fabricate used to mean a lot of different things to different people. So I don't know which part of Fabricate have you heard about. Yeah. The Fabricate that I'm talking about today is the Fabricate plugin. Uh, for Maven, which allows you to deploy, package, configure, and develop your applications on the Kubernetes and OpenShift platform, right? There are other sessions showcasing these uh, this, uh, plugin capabilities, but uh, in case you just uh, find James Tracking running on the corridors here, he is the, one of the creators of the Fabricate Maven plugin, and one of the cool features that we have for developing Spring Boot applications, if you, if you add the plugin, the Fabricate plugin automatically detects that you're using a Spring Boot application. So it automatically configures for you your container and your OpenShift or Kubernetes template for deployment. It automatically configures you the starting points, the memory configurations, the, the stack configurations for Kubernetes and platform, and automatically also uh, adds the right uh, readiness and liveness probes for your Spring Boot applications. So the, the plugin is smart enough to detect that it, that's a Spring Boot application and provide the right configuration for you in Kubernetes OpenShift so you don't have to worry about it, right? And that's what I have to show you today in this short talk. I hope it's useful for you and I'm available for some questions for you. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, there are some companies using uh, them, uh, but it's not a ready to use feature of OpenShift yet, okay, because uh, it's not directly supported through the Red Hat stack, right? But we have people using that. For using, yeah, it, in fact, it's not a library because you don't have to change your application, right? You just have to change the, the YAML or JSON file of your Kubernetes OpenShift deployments. So you just, it, it's a plug and play solution. You don't have to change anything. You just plug it and you automatically start creating the circuit breaking and balancing, load balancing solution and tracing. 
Yeah? If, you have, if you're able to check, the, the, there, there are some sessions about the Hockler team, uh, which, uh, which are responsible for the tracing. This is a supported Red Hat solution. So you can add a, a sidecar container for tracing, and it, it, you don't have to change your application. It automatically traces your, all of your requests in your system. Okay, because Hockler is a Java agent. It just plugs in your like Spring Boot application and start tracing everything for you. Hockler, yeah. Yes, you can configure, uh, all of these things are configurable uh, per endpoint. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you have multiple different routing strategies. You can even, uh, you can even add some conditionals if the request for this URI is has these headers, I'm going to route to this set of, uh, it's all configurable. You just have to type more YAML, which is the new XML. <laughs> yeah. But it's configurable per URI. I just showed here, uh, I just used one endpoint. Yeah, uh, if you have your application, and you have uh, other endpoints in your system, then Linkerd, uh, your application transparently connects to Linkerd, and LinkerD issues the request to the endpoints. It gets back and answers to you. So all of your communication between your application and the sidecar container, LinkerD, is done through localhost. That's why it doesn't give a significant overhead for your application. Right. Yeah, LinkerD acts on the client side. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't intercept outbound requests, even though it could, but it's, it's not the default behavior. Right, uh, I'll, gi I'll give you a, 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 a tracing scenario, for example. Right, I have my application. Uh, uh, this endpoint is external. The requests are coming. Then my application needs to uh, query another uh, microservice. Right, it will proxy through Linkerd. Linkerd will connect to the remote microservice. But since that remote microservice is internal, and I want tracing, then on that one, Linkerd will proxy the incoming connections too. Yeah, and we'll. Uh, when the response comes, uh, it will get back through Linkerd again, then I'll have the full trace information. So Linkerd, if you're, if you're acting like for client-side load balance and everything, it's a client-side proxy, but it can proxy also incoming connections in case you need uh, tracing, for example. So uh, you can configure both ways. Right. Yeah, in both, yeah, you have one Linkerd here and the other one, and it proxies both, both ends. Okay. That's the, not, not just Linkerd. Uh, uh, Right, HAProxy usually uh, it provides you a different kind of uh, capabilities because HAProxy usually you do that for different. How do I say? Uh, HAProxy is not sophisticated enough to have the kinds of uh, capabilities Linkerd has. Uh, how to explain? Linkerd is yeah because uh, uh, Linkerd or Envoy. Okay, yeah, well, everything is configurable, of course, but uh, it integrates with Kubernetes services. So you have like endpoint customer. And all of these endpoints, you have different versions, but it's the same application because they're all responding on the same uh, Kubernetes name. So uh, it integrates so it knows which are the endpoints and it keeps its load balancing the request between the endpoints. And if you say though, if it takes more than 20 milliseconds, it's out. So Linkerd on the client side automatically gets it off the pool and it tries again later. Oh, it's just too slow, it keeps, keeps it off. But all of this information is stored on the client side Linkerd instance. instance. Yes, because if you're Linkerd, for, it, that's cool because uh, first it communicates through localhost, you don't want a network overhead. And if Linkerd fails, uh, it makes your pod restart. So you never, you never have the, 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 the situation where, oh, my Linkerd is not running. No, it never happens because it's not running, your application is restarting too. 